It's Friday, January 16th, 2015, and you're listening to the Armchair Atheism Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Carr, and today I'm pleased to bring you an interview with Massimo Piliucci, a scientist and philosopher of science who has written on, talked about, debated, and generally done a whole lot of work around the subjects of science and pseudoscience. For this third episode, the topic of discussion will be the nature of science, broadly speaking, what it is, how it works, and where certain phenomena fall in relation to it. This is a huge subject, of course, and so I hope to expand on issues covered here, as well as those not covered, in future episodes of the podcast. I hope you enjoy the interview. Massimo Pellucci is professor of philosophy at CUNY City College, holds PhDs both in biology and the philosophy of science, and co-hosts the Rationally Speaking podcast along with Julia Galef. He has written numerous articles on science and philosophy, debated several well-known creationists, and authored multiple books, including Denying Evolution, Nonsense on Stilts, and Answers for Aristotle. His most recent work, Philosophy of Pseudoscience, is an anthology of essays on the distinction between sound science and pseudoscience, co-edited with Martin Boudry. Massimo, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, as was just mentioned, you started out your career as an evolutionary scientist, but then eventually moved into working as a philosopher. Can you talk a little bit about what motivated this change of focus, which doesn't seem to be all that common among scientists or among philosophers? It's not that common. Uh, you're right. Um, it basically was my midlife crisis. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> at some point, I've been, I've been interested in philosophy for a long time. Um, uh, I did a high school in Italy and college in Italy and in, in, in um, many European countries, you actually have to take two or three years, uh, of philosophy. In my case, three years of philosophy in high school. And I always had an interest in, in, in the subject, uh, from that point on. But um, I decided to go for a career as a scientist. Um, it worked out uh, very well for me, and I did the, the standard uh, pr- uh, proceeding of, uh, you know, of, of an academic career, uh, assistant professor, uh, full prof- uh, associate, and then full professor uh, at different places, at University of Tennessee and then um, uh, Stony Brook University on Long Island, which has a very good department of ecology and evolution. But then, um, so at some point, I kind of felt, on the one hand, like um, I, I needed some different sort of intellectual landscapes to explore, so to speak. And I also felt like my interest in evolutionary biology uh, was getting more and more theoretical, more and more toward the conceptual side of evolutionary theory, even though I was running a em- empirical experimental uh, lab. Um, and now, when you start being interested in, in theoretical and especially sort of conceptual issues in um, in science, you're already halfway towards philosophy of science. Uh, so, so the interest was there, uh, the, the, the moment was right, and then sort of serendipity happened. It just happened that when I was a faculty at the University of Tennessee, toward the last uh, few years that I was there, uh, the university also hired a brilliant um, philosopher of biology, Jonathan Kaplan, and we sort of hit it off very well. We became friends, uh, and uh, the idea occurred to me that if I wanted to pursue philosophy seriously, I could go back to graduate school and ask Jonathan to be my advisor, and uh, that worked out. Um, and uh, a few years later, I was able, after publishing my thesis uh, with the University of Chicago Press and a few other papers, I was able to actually switch full-time to philosophy, uh, which I've done uh, thanks to the City University of New York. So it was a combination of sort of background interest for a long time, a need for a change, and then sort of the, the luck of having the, the right circumstances. Well, that's interesting. Um, would you say, it sounds like if you had some experience with philosophy in high school, um, were you ever one of those scientists that really didn't appreciate or kind of even looked down on philosophy, or was that not the case? No, that was not the case. Incidentally, I don't actually know a lot of scientists who look down to philosophy. Most scientists just don't think about philosophy at all. Um, because it's not their business, uh, just like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a lot of engineers don't usually think about philosophy or that sort of stuff. Um, it, it is, however, the case, um, as I think you were hinting at, that there is a number of especially high-profile scientists, and mostly physicists, although not exclusively, uh, who have been on record for, you know, making disparaging comments about philosophy. Uh, the, the list is, is a fairly prestigious one. You know, Richard Feynman, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, Stephen Weinberg, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know, there's, there's a number of them. Um, no, I was never one of those, and I think that actually is a deeply misguided attitude to uh, to take anyway. And in fact, I've taken to task 
uh, most of these people, you know, Feynman has been dead now for a number of years, but I've had uh, fairly intense conversations with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, for instance, about it, um, and I wrote about his position and why he's um, uh, is really uncalled for. Yeah, on that subject, actually, um, you seem to be of the opinion, I've heard Daniel Dennett call it, uh, that there is no such thing as philosophy-free science. Is is that basically your view on the subject? Yeah, I think that should be any sensible person's view <laughs> on the subject. I mean, if you know anything at all about uh, science and a little bit about philosophy, you realize that um, a number, a good number of philosophical assumptions and practices go into the regular practice of science. I mean, science is based on a number of metaphysical and epistemological assumptions, uh, which can be justified or analyzed philosophically, but certainly not empirically. Um, so to claim that science is, uh, you know, this, this uh, search for pure objective factual truth about the world is incredibly naive, and it is actually surprising that a number of physicists seem to take on that uh, uh, sort of naive realism. Uh, lots of physicists don't. Lots of physicists are much more sophisticated than that, both among contemporary physicists. I can cite, for instance, Sean Carroll, uh, and Lee Smolin, both of, both of whom are prominent physicists today and both of whom realize the importance of, uh, of philosophy uh, underpinning uh, physics. Um, and historically, I mean, uh, Albert Einstein is famous for, uh, for saying that he just did not understand why some of his colleagues thought that they could do without uh, a, a minimum background in philosophy because he thought that was a, a, an incredibly um, naive and simplistic way of thinking about science. So what would you say are probably some of the, I guess, biggest reasons why you think that philosophy kind of has to undergird science? Well, one thing first to, to make clear, um, although occasionally philosophy, especially philosophy of science, is directly useful to science, right? So there are some areas, and maybe if you want we can talk about it a little bit more in a few minutes, but there are some areas of overlap uh, between philosophy of science especially and science itself where the philosophers are actually useful directly to the scientists and, vi and vice versa. But most of the time, that is not the case. And, and in fact, it, putting it that way, it's kind of making uh, what philosophers call often a category, category mistake, that is asking quest the wrong, essentially the wrong question. To, to say, like, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson again or Stephen Hawkins have done, you know, well, what is, what is philosophy good, uh, if it doesn't actually contribute to the advancement of science? It's, it's a very strange question if you think about it because the business of philosophy is not to advance science. We got science for that and it works very, very well. Thank you very much. So, um, it, it would be, again, like, like saying, you know, what is the point of history of science, for instance, if it doesn't advance science? That question never occurs to anybody, any sensible mind, because it's clearly the wrong question to ask. The, the point of history of science is to understand the historical process by which science unfolds. Or let's take sociology of science. I don't think many people expect sociologists of science to answer scientific questions. What they do expect them to do is to shed light on the sociological um, underpinning of science, that is, on the power relations, on, on the uh, human interactions, and so on and so forth. Uh, that characterize science as a human enterprise. Similarly, uh, the goal of philosophy, and in particular philosophy of science, is not to solve scientific questions, is to understand how science works from an epistemic perspective. Uh, that is, how is it that science, scientists justify their claims? What is the relationship between theory and, and, uh, and empirical evidence? Um, you know, that sort of stuff. You know, what is the structure of scientific theories? Those are the kinds of questions that are epistemological in nature, uh, and therefore philosoph fundamentally philosophical, because epistemology is a branch of philosophy. And frankly, I, th those are the questions that scientists usually don't pose uh, to themselves because they don't have the, the requisite uh, expertise, they're not epistemologists, and also because they don't care. Uh, it's not like, you know, you, need, you don't need to be to understand sociology or history of science to do science, and you don't need to understand philosophy of science to do science. But that doesn't license a rejection of those three disciplines from the part of the scientists. Uh, it sounds like this is also kind of getting close to what your latest book co-edited with uh, Boudry is on, which is the demarcation problem. Right. Uh, do you feel like this is something that can kind of contribute to forming a good understanding of the nature of science? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the demarcation problem uh, is a phrase that was coined by Karl Popper, one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. 
And in fact, ironically, one of the few philosophers that probably any scientist can mention, uh, if you really ask them, because he's, he, Popper was responsible for the, uh, uh, the proposal of the, of the concept of falsification. Um, for Popper, he, a scientific theory is, is scientific in nature if it can be falsified. That is, if there is a, a way in principle uh, to empirically reject the theory. Right? If, it, if it's not possible to falsify a theory, uh, then according to Popper, that's just not science. Um, it's something else. It could be metaphysics. It could be, you know, whatever, uh, folk uh, uh, knowledge, but it's certainly not, not science. Now, interestingly, um, Popper came up with the idea of falsification precisely because he was trying to solve the demarcation problem. As it turns out, he was not able to solve it. He thought he did, but he was not. Uh, but he did contribute some interesting insights. So the, the demarcation problem is this. You know, how do we tell uh, from an from a epistemic perspective, from the point of view of epistemology, the difference between science and pseudoscience? Now, we all agree, presumably, that there is such a difference, that, that you know, if you take the most extreme examples, right, uh, it's very clear, it seems to me, that astronomy is a science and astrology is a pseudoscience. It is equally clear to me that, uh, you know, medicine, uh, you know, medical research uh, based on sort of biochemistry and, and, and physiology is a science, as imperfect as it is, while homeopathy is a pseudoscience. Uh, it is also clear to me that, uh, you know, the search for extra uh, terrestrial planets done by astronomers is science. Uh, UFOs uh, studies are pseudoscience and so on and so forth, right? We could go on um, for, for a while with, with uh, examples. Now, if we agree that there is that difference, um, then the question is, well, what makes for that difference? Uh, what, what is it, what is it that, that separates astrology from astronomy, homeopathy from medical research, and so on and so forth? Um, and that's the kind of a question that, um, that Popper was interested in. And of course, in order to answer that question, you do have to come up with some kind of definition of science and, and or some kind of definition of pseudoscience, because otherwise you don't get studied. So the way Popper thought that he was going to solve the problem was by introducing the demarcation criterion. He would say, he said basically, look, science is that kind of epistemic activity that deals with empirically falsifiable conjectures or, or theories or hypotheses. You know, a scientific theory like, like say, for instance, his, his favorite example was Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, which had been proposed at the beginning of the 20th century and had been just spectacularly confirmed um, uh, during a famous uh, uh, eclipse, of, a total eclipse of the sun in, back in 1919. And you know, astronomers basically had uh, gone out and checked one of the fun, one of the crucial uh, predictions of Einstein's theory. If Einstein was right, then they should have observed a, a slight bending of the light. Um, uh, due to the gravitational mass of, this, of the sun. And the best way to uh, observe that bending is during a total eclipse, because during a total eclipse, of course, it's dark. And what you should be doing, what the, what the theory predicts, is that you should be observing the emergence and the disappearing of stars in the background of the sun with a slight delay or a slight anticipation uh, compared to, to, to if there were actually, if, the, if light were, were traveling straight. In other words, if light is bending around the sun because of the gravitational attraction of, uh, of the star, uh, then you should be able basically to peek around the sun a little bit and see the star, um, you know, at a different time. Now, that can be precise, that, that, that calculation can be done precisely. The observations were done by astronomers all over the world, and sure enough, uh, Einstein's theory was was confirmed. That, by the way, is what made Einstein a celebrity overnight. I mean, that it was the, the thing was on the uh, front page of the newspapers. Now, according to Popper, that's a good example of science because what the theory had done um, was to stick its neck out, basically, uh, uh, making that very precise, very unusual prediction. And, and and the neck of the theory could have been chopped off if the prediction had turned out to be wrong. In other words, the theory was falsifiable. It just happened not to be false. It survived the attempt of falsification, but it could have actually died that, that day during that eclipse, um, according to Popper. Um, by the same token, so the other side of the, same, of the same coin is, on the other hand, if you take a typical pseudoscience, and Popper's example actually was um, uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, uh, Freudian and Adlerian psychoanalysis, actually. Um, if you take those, those theories... Well, then they seem to be compatible with pretty much any kind of evidence whatsoever. 
you know, if if any if any of, of Freud's clients, this is actually true that there 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 are um, documented examples in his writings. Uh, if any of uh, Freud's clients or patients uh, were behaving in a way that was not predictable predicted by its, the- its theory, then Freud would say that, well, that's because they developed an antagonism directly with him as a therapist, which led them subconsciously to behave in a way that undermines his theory, which, of course, is predicted by his theory. Uh, well, if you put it that way, there is no empirical disconfirmation or falsification at all that can be done. Every possible new bit of information is compatible with the theory. If that's the case, according to Popper, the theory is pseudoscientific, Right? Now, that all sounds very nice and clear-cut and, you know, very easy to apply, and that should tell you that it's probably wrong because, you know, uh, because the distinction between science and pseudoscience is actually much more complicated, much more nuanced, even though there are, in fact, these extreme cases where the, the, the falsification criteria actually works pretty well. There's a lot of other stuff in between. There are a lot of other fields uh, or hypotheses that are kind of borderline. I mean, some notions in parapsychology, for instance, for a long time were actually borderline. I, I don't think, at this point, I think the, the, the jury is out and, and you know, there is no, no reliable evidence in favor of, you know, sort of parapsychological phenomena. But for a long time, the, the, the uh, you know, meaning decades throughout the 20th century, the jury was out. It's, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll see. Uh, it's possible, it's unlikely, but it's still possible. Conversely, there are some areas of inquiry that we think of as scientific, uh, like, for instance, string theory um, in physics, that, however, so far have not only not been falsified, they're not falsifiable technically, um, because they don't make predictions that are actually testable empirically. Now, uh, nobody is going to go out there and say, and say that, that string theory is pseudoscience, uh, but at the same token, it's not even full-fledged science either. And in fact, a lot of physicists are becoming aware of it, and there's a lot of discussions within the physics community, and so on and so forth. So, so Popper got the extreme, the easy, the easy cases right. Uh, it was, but his criterion of falsification was just not enough, not powerful enough to uh, solve the problem for of, of the demarcation problem for more complex issues. Which is why Martin and I have, have put together this collection that you were referred to, asking a bunch of people out there who have been thinking about the demarcation problem, what they think and wh- where they think the the, the, the field um, that field of inquiry is. So I know that uh, some of the recent, I guess, subject matter debate that's been stirred up over the the demarcation problem also has a lot to do with uh, Thomas Kuhn's book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Is that something that you see playing into it with the way that he talks about the puzzle solving in that and the way that uh, science progresses more through, uh, if I remember right, it's it's kind of like a, a strained process from what he describes of of yeah. basically people having to let go of existing paradigms. Right. Yeah, according to Kuhn, who, by the way, was a physicist, uh, who then turned historian and philosopher of science. Um, according to Kuhn, the way science uh, progress, make progress over time, is by by paradigm shifts. So, uh, so he's, in, in a nutshell, his view of science was this. Most of the time, uh, scientists use a particular paradigm uh, which is not only a particular theory, but also all the methods that go uh, into using that theory, both experimental methods and analytical methods uh, that go into using that theory for solving specific issues, specific problems. Most of the time, scientists simply use a paradigm, let's say the standard model in, the- in physics or evolutionary theory, you know, the Winian theory in biology, things like that. Um, scientists use those without questioning the paradigm in- Itself, they use them to solve what uh, Kuhn uh, referred to as uh, as puzzles. They, they, they do puzzle solving. Now, he didn't mean that disparagingly. He meant that uh, most regular science, most normal science, is actually made out of, of trying to solve local problems by deploying the dominant paradigm. Now, what happens, however, is that from time to time, certain puzzles, certain problems cannot be solved uh, using the paradigm. And then the sensible scientist... Uh, simply sets them aside. Says, okay, well, I can't solve this problem now, probably because we don't have enough data, or we don't have the right instrumentation, you know, or, or I'm missing something here, so let's move on and do something else. These unsolved problems become what, what Kuhn calls anomalies within the paradigms. That is, these are, these are things that the paradigm cannot explain. Now, 
uh, over time, what often happens, according to Kuhn, is that the number of anomalies goes up. It, it keeps increasing. And at some point, it becomes so large that scientists begin to feel uncomfortable with the paradigm itself. So they, they begin to feel like the paradigm is actually not solving enough problems, uh, that there must be something wrong with the paradigm or missing or, 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 or incomplete in the paradigm. And then they start looking around for a different paradigm. If they find it, and if the new paradigm solves as many problems as the previous one, plus a good number of anomalies, uh, then there is a paradigm shift. There is, there is a, a shifting from one way of looking at the world to another one. And there is a number of examples of this in the history of uh, science, in particular the history of physics. You know, the, the classic old one is the, the shift uh, between the Ptolemaic uh, and the Copernican view uh, in astronomy, right? So it's either either the idea that the Earth is the center of the of the universe, or the idea that the sun is the center and the earth and the other planets go around. That's a paradigm shift. And it was brought up, uh, brought about by an increasing number of anomalies. I mean, you know, Ptolemaic astronomers had to come up and invent new and new, uh, newer and newer epicycles. There's these theoretical structures that helped making predictions about the position of the planets, but their predictions about the position of the planets can't be, uh, fairly, um, uh, inaccurate. Another paradigm shift has been the, the transition between Newtonian mechanics and Einstein's relativity. Uh, a, immediately after that, there was a sort of a parallel shift uh, that with the introduction of quantum mechanics. And of course, now physicists are thinking about the poten- another potential paradigm shift if it turns out that we have to replace the standard model with something like string theory or loop quantum gravity or any other of, of a number of alternatives that have been floating around. Um, so that's an interesting view of science. It doesn't hold in all the sciences and it doesn't hold all the time. For instance, I've argued in, 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 in a paper, in a couple of papers that there's never been a paradigm shift in evolutionary biology since Darwin. That is, if you really want to talk about evolutionary, uh, uh biology paradigm shifts, the only one that really happened was the, the, the transition from, uh, pre-Darwinian natural theology to the Darwinian paradigm. After that, the theory has been modified. I mean, we don't use today the same theory that Darwin introduced. We use a much more sophisticated and complex theory, which is called the modern synthesis. Um, uh, but that theory is not um, uh, in contradiction or has not replaced the Darwinian theory. It's simply grown on top of it. It's, it's been, it has expanded. Now, back to what you were saying, however, about uh, sort of the connection between Kuhn and these discussions about pseudoscience. Now, what Kuhn often has been taken to say, however, um, is that essentially there is no progress in the sense of cumulative progress in science. All it is is, is scientists at some point decide to look at the world in a different way, um, but that there is no principled reason for, for one paradigm being better than another. Um, that is um, a reading of Kuhn that is incorrect, as Kuhn himself pointed out. He was actually pissed off. Uh, that people were reading him in that way. So he wrote a, a famous postscript to the list, uh, to the last edition of the Structure of Scientific Revolution saying that no, I don't, I don't mean it that way. Uh, he was being appropriated basically by people that today we, we consider postmodernist. The famous science war of the 1990s, um, happened in part between sort of postmodernist, radical postmodernist philosophers and, uh, on the one hand and, uh, most scientists and most other philosophers on the other hand. Um, happened in part because the postmodernists sort of uh, uh, appropriated uh, Kuhn uh, and they claimed that, you know, scientific knowledge is no better than any other kind of knowledge, that it's just, it's just one way of looking at the world, uh, that there's no principal reason for, for uh, um, sort of giving more credence to uh, a scientific worldview. That is definitely not what Kuhn <laughs> said. Um, uh, although he did bring it upon himself uh, in some sense, uh, he, he should have known that because uh, he used a, a very powerful metaphor to explain uh, his theory of paradigm shift. And it turns out, however, that the metaphor was just a little too powerful. Uh, he introduced the idea of um, uh, uh, from Gestalt psychology of Gestalt images. Gestalt images, um, uh, your listeners can look them up. There are some; they're ve- very well known, but there's some that are really fun. These are the kind of images that you can look at it two different ways, and there is no right interpretation of it. So typically, is you know, you look at one of these and you look and you seem to uh, see either a vase um, against the dark background or two dark faces against the white background. 
uh, or another image shows what looks like either a, a young woman turning away from you or a very old woman looking at you, that sort of stuff. Yeah, speaking of pseudoscience, actually, I was yeah. watching a, an episode of Fringe recently, which is kind of like yeah. X-Files meets Twilight Zone, and they yeah. had uh, yeah. the yeah. duck and the rabbit image in there. That's which right. is, it can be viewed as a duck or it can be viewed as a rabbit, depending that's, on... That's exactly right. And that, and that in fact, is, is one of the uh, classic Gestalt um, images. Now, um, you can see why uh, that analogy is powerful for Kuhn, because he says, look, uh, a paradigm is just like, it, it, a paradigm shift is just like the feeling that you have uh, after you've been staring at a, at a Gestalt image and interpreting in one way, all of a sudden your brain switches to the other interpretation, the alternative interpretation. You have, you have shifted your paradigm. You have shifted the way in which you look at things. That's very powerful. That's, that's a really good way of, of explaining the feeling that scientists sometimes sometime have uh, when they sort of start looking at things in a, in a novel way. Unfortunately, however, the fact of the matter is that, of course, there is no fact of the matter about which Gestalt image is right and which one is wrong. I mean, there is no rabbit there and there is no duck. It's just lines on paper. Uh, right, so you cannot argue that once you switch from the duck to the rabbit view, you make progress. Um, and and so that was an unfortunate use of a metaphor that really got Kuhn into trouble. But it, it was very clear later on that it did, that's not what he meant. He did not mean to say that there is no progress in science. He just meant to use, you know, he just had used a particular metaphor that sort of ran away in a direction that was not uh, not foreseen by him. By him. So that seems like a good point to touch on also, sort of like the converse of what we were talking about before with uh, certain scientists who kind of go beyond, I guess one would say, science and sort of speculate on philosophy without maybe realizing it. Uh, what, on the other hand, would you say that philosophy, to the extent it should be informed by the sciences, because as you just mentioned, there are philosophers who have taken things like uh, Thomas Kuhn's research and writing and use that to basically sort of try and undermine the sciences. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 um, the issue cuts both ways. On the one hand, scientists should either not talk about philosophy if they don't understand it, if they haven't read uh, the, the, the primary literature, or if they want to talk about it, they're more than welcome, but they should do due diligence and, and sort of understand the philosophy. That goes exactly the, the same way, uh, the other way around. Uh, too many philosophers talk about science without actually understanding the science. Um, and again, there is, there is especially a number of prominent philosophers, like I can mention a couple, uh, Jerry Fodor uh, and Thomas Nagel, for instance, were both very prominent philosophers. They're, they're, these are very smart guys, just like on the other side, you know, Stephen Hawking and Richard Feynman are very smart people. Uh, it's not that we're not talking about idiots here. Um, but uh, just like Stephen Hawking clearly does not understand anything about philosophy and hasn't read anything about philosophy. I can guarantee you that that is the case by the way he talks about it. It is also the case that Jerry Fodor and Thomas Nagel, who are philosophers of mind, not philosophers of science, have clearly either not read much science or they haven't read you know, enough science to actually have a good uh, sort of cognizant uh, understanding of what they're talking about. And so they go on, uh, on, on, on making claims that are clearly... Uh, questionable and objectionable uh, from a scientific perspective. And in fact, they have typically been called on by philosophers. I mean, I wrote a uh, scathing review of Jerry Fodor's book, uh, Why Darwin uh, Was Wrong, or What Darwin Got Wrong, actually, I think that's the right title, um, and, and which was published in Nature magazine. And a number of philosophy colleagues, um, beginning with Elliot Sober, for instance, wrote scathing reviews of Thomas Nagel's more recent book, I uh, think a mind in the cosmos is the title. So it's not like these discussions don't go on and these mistakes don't, uh, don't happen on the philosophy side. Of course they do. But it's also the case that, you know, philosophy actually does a remarkable, remarkably good job at policing itself. Um, precisely because there are philosophers of science who actually know about science and they, they, they understand what, what the whole thing is about and how it works. And so whenever one of their colleagues sort of goes off the rails, they, they are the first ones to sort of uh, say, wait a minute, no, that's, that's, not, that's just not an acceptable way of talking about, about science. Uh, that was also the case with postmodernism. I mean, postmodernism is, is a very complex um, uh, sort of cultural phenomenon. It actually started, it actually started out uh, in, uh, outside of uh, philosophy and literary criticism and then sort of got imported into philosophy later on. 
Um, but it is a very particular type of philosophy. It's a very particular view within philosophy. And it has been criticized um, really harshly and seriously and, 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 uh, and consistently by a lot of other philosophers, particularly, again, philosophers of science. Uh, so for a scientist like, let's say, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who explicitly says uh, that he rejects you know, philosophy on the ground that philosophers say the kinds of things that um, that basically postmodernists say. Uh, that's just not not a good way of going about it because, uh, as it turns out, he's talking about a, a, a very localized, very particular group of philosophers who demonstrably know nothing about science or know very little about science and really in, should not talk about science. But just because a particular subgroup within a discipline says really silly things. Uh, outside of their area of expertise, we shouldn't uh, dismiss the whole of the discipline because otherwise we should uh, we should um, apply the same concept to science. And then every time that uh, Neil or Stephen Hawking says something bizarre about other dis- disciplines, that should license somehow rejecting physics or, or astronomy. Of course, it doesn't. Sure. Um, so this seems to sort of tie together into. Just generally, this will be an easy question. What is science? <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, also, like, just if in uh, maybe distinction with pseudoscience, like, do you feel like we can see some of the warning signs or something of pseudoscience that can inform how we see science and understand it as an enterprise or a methodology or just even a body of knowledge? Yeah. Um, now, that's an excellent question. Now, uh, philosophers, I think, rightly have uh, given up on the idea that complex concepts like science or pseudoscience can be defined uh, clearly and, 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 and simply. Uh, in fact, it was uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the most influence, influential philosophers also in the 20th century, contemporary of Popper, uh, and who was not, by the way, a philosopher of science. He was actually more interested in philosophy of uh, language and philosophy of mind. But uh, Wittgenstein proposed at some point that uh, most complex concepts, uh, and although he did not talk directly about science, science certainly falls into that category, um, most complex concepts are what he called family resemblance concepts, or today we will call them uh, in analogy with a, with a biological family. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, we will call them sort of fuzzy concepts. Or, or, or uh, what, what, he meant, what he meant by this is, is, is this. Uh, you know, if you were to ask me, uh, what is the essential definition of membership in the Pilucci family, right, in the biological family uh, that, that recognizes itself as, you know, bearing the surname Pilucci, I would look at you and say, well, there is no such a thing. There is no essence of the, you know, Pilucci's, just like there is no essence of uh, Tyson or Hawking or anything like that. What it is, is there is a group of individuals that share certain characteristics. So if you look at, the, and of course, they, they share also some genetic similarity, clearly. Uh, that's why they have those characteristics in common, right? So if, if we were to look at uh, photos of myself and of members of my family and then compare them with photos of random members of the population, uh, you know, an accurate observation will probably reveal that there are more things in common, more characteristics in common between myself and members of my family than there are between myself and members of, you know, the, a general member of the population. That's what he meant by, what, what Wittgenstein meant by family resemblance. Now, if a concept uh, is, is based on a sort of a family resemblance, then it is not possible to give a precise definition of that concept. Uh, it, it's just it, it's just not going to work. By precise definition, I mean something like this. Uh, let's say if if you were to ask me uh, what is the definition of a triangle, uh, it's easy. Uh, I can tell you a triangle is a geometrical figure whose in, uh, the, uh, the sum of the internal angles is 180 degrees. That's it. That's all it takes. Uh, having the internal angle, the sum of the internal angles uh, coming up to 180 degrees is a necessary and sufficient condition for being a triangle. It's necessary, meaning that if you do not have it, if your angles don't add up to 180 degrees, then you're not a triangle. And it is sufficient, meaning that if you do have it, that's all in, That's all I need to know in order to say, oh, yeah, that's a triangle, right? But nothing like that works for more complex uh, concepts such as uh, science and pseudoscience. Then what? Then what are we going to do about it? Well, what Wittgenstein suggested was uh, to to start by looking at examples, uh, beginning with the clear ones, with the ones that clearly fit 
in, you know, into the, just a general understanding of, you know, science on the one end and pseudoscience on the other, and then moving into more complicated and borderline cases. And essentially, developing uh, uh, a search image, de- developing a sort of a, uh, an understanding of um, whatever cluster of characteristics are more likely to be found in one concept than, than another. Uh, he applied that to specific concepts, like, for instance, he, was, uh, he asked his readers to consider the question of what makes a game a game. What, what is it that makes something a game? Um, and, and it's a deceptively easy question. If you start thinking about it, you probably start giving me a list of characteristics, like, you know, games are for fun, for instance. Well, yeah, but there are lots of things that we do for fun and they're not games, like having sex, for instance. Um, um, well, I guess that depends on who you ask. <laughs> that, that definitely depends on who you ask. Um, or you can say, well, games are, you know, follow rules. Well, all sorts of other things follow rules. You know, uh, the law is based on, on following rules, for instance. Um, and so on and so forth. I mean, you can say, well, they're, they're, they're played with, uh, for, uh, for, to, for winning. Well, all sorts of things are played for winning that are not games and all of that, but there are some games that actually do not in, entail a, a, a winner, like solitaire, for instance. And so on and so forth. So the idea is that no matter how many characteristics, characteristics you list, there's always going to be exceptions. There are always going to be situations where they don't fit very well. But what it what it's true is that a number of these characteristics form a a, a network, uh, let, let's say a net that undergears underpins what we feel are what we consider games. It is true that the majority of games are competitive. They have rules. They're usually played for fun and so on and so forth. It's just that there are exceptions. Okay. Um, now the same goes for science and pseudoscience. So it's true that there are some extreme uh, sciences and examples of science and pseudosciences where you can pretty clearly say, well, look, uh, uh, fundamental physics, let's say, is an epistemic activity which is based on you know, sophisticated uh, um, observations and experiments which are driven by mathematically uh, formulated theories. Uh, and that, uh, and where the experiments are uh, carried out by using uh, large and complex equipment, such as you know the Large Hadron Collider. Sure, but that definition of science, of course, doesn't apply to a lot of other sciences. Uh, you know, it doesn't apply to geology, it doesn't apply to biology, it certainly doesn't apply to psychology. So uh, you have to come up with some kind of fuzzy understanding. It, it, uh, in my book, in Nonsense on Stills, there is a diagram uh, that that shows these these complex landscape where you have at one extreme the clearly, obviously scientific disciplines and the other extreme you have uh, clearly, obviously pseudo-scientific notions and then you have a lot of stuff in between that's interesting and that's where the actual discussions um, are. And that's, that's where the, the interesting stuff actually comes up. Well, I mean, I could hear or imagine a bunch of homeopaths or astrologers or something basically responding that um, this kind of sort of already sets the stage to begin with, that it starts by assuming its conclusions. But as you've said, it seems like there there are actually truths here about these things resembling each other. So how would you address something like that where they basically accuse you of rigging the game to begin with? Well, first of all, they're obviously wrong in my mind. <laughs> I have no trouble um, uh, you know, stating that. But, but, of course, the question is, well, why are they wrong? I think they're not wrong. They're wrong because they don't, they don't, they don't have an appreciation of the history of science the, uh, and, and, in fact, of the uh, sociology even of, of science. I mean, the way Wittgenstein's approach works is by observation. You actually go out there and say, okay, what is it that people are calling sciences and calling pseudosciences, and why are they calling them that way, and what are these people doing? Uh, it's, it's very much an observational thing. You, you, you look at the history of these disciplines, and you look at how they actually practice, uh, and then you come up, you, you formulate these, the, the criteria as a result. And I don't think even the most rabid homeopath would say that fundamental physics is not a science. They're going to disagree about the status of homeopathy, obviously. Um, but they're certainly going to agree on fundamental physics being, being a science. And once you start, and they will probably agree on geology, biology, and a bunch of other things. So once you start establishing a certain number of examples, then you have a family resemblance. And then you can say, okay, well, now how, ta- how does homeopathy compare with these things? 
And and it's pretty obvious to me that the comparison is not good for homeopathy uh, because the theory uh, underlying uh, homeopathy is, you know, hasn't moved since the 19th century. Uh, right there, that's a bad sign. Usually scientific theories change all the time. They improve all the time. Um, second of all, it is based on... Uh, on certain assumptions, such as, uh, let's say, the memory uh, of water or the uh, or the idea that smaller and smaller quantities of certain chemicals have larger, you know, more and more powerful effects, those ideas directly contradict everything we know about biology, physics, and chemistry. Um, and moreover, whenever we've done the experiments, which have been done, you know, homeopathy has, in fact, been, uh, uh, you know, subjected to empirical analysis, uh, they come up with nothing. You know, homeopathic uh, treatments uh, usually give you pretty much the placebo effect, but nothing more. So, so the idea is that uh, although the homeopath or the ufologist or, you know, you pick your, your favorite pseudoscience, obviously is going to disagree. The fact is that he's going to immediately be in a really um, defensive position because as long as he agrees that there are good examples of sciences, and as long as he agrees that those are the models after which we should understand how science is done, then, then by comparison, his own particular field suffers immediately and pretty, and pretty obviously, I think. Well, this kind of brings something interesting to mind for me, though, because when you talk about family resemblances, uh, do you perceive, like, maybe any of these resemblances being things like possibly falsification or anything like that? Because I had a conversation, actually, with a creationist not that long ago, who raised this objection to me of how even if you could prove that life came from non-life, you'd be doing it basically by design through human agents and stuff. So therefore, you could never prove that life came from non-life. And to me, that when, when there's just no possible way of proving someone's claim wrong like that, right. that seems like it says something. So is it more like the essentialist side of falsification that you reject or do you think there's something more problematic with it that it couldn't quite be considered as one of the criteria on, or criteria well, for uh, family resemblances? That's an excellent question. There are two problems with falsification. Um, it's not that it doesn't work at all, by the way. I mean, you know, people do go out and, and try to falsify theories, but there, but there are two problems. Uh, on the one hand, it's not a good uh, uh, criterion to distinguish science from, from pseudoscience because for instance, homeopathy has been, in fact, falsified over and over and over. Uh, and so has creationism. You, you know, if, if by creation you mean that the, the young earth version, for, for instance, well, that one has been falsified over and over. You know, a bunch of claims being made by uh, uh, young earth geologists, for instance, have been falsified by uh, use of geology, chemistry, and biology, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, falsification is not a criterion that demarcates science from pseudoscience because you can actually very well um, falsify pseudoscientific notions. In fact, arguably, falsification works better with pseudoscience than with science. And the reason it works better with, with pseudoscience than with science is the, reason, is the second reason falsification is problematic, which is this. This was pointed out, uh, by the way, uh, many, many decades ago um, uh, by Pierre Duhem. Pierre Duhem was a physicist, again, uh, who turned into, um, uh, he had in, uh, strong interest in, in philosophy of science, and Duen pointed out that technically you cannot actually falsify a complex scientific theory uh, for the simple reason that complex scientific theories are not single statements, right? They're not, they're not simple things. They are um, built of a number of statements, assumptions, empirical observations, you know, all sorts of other stuff which he called ancillary hypothesis or it's ancillary uh, information. Um, now, if you try to test a scientific theory, and the test fails, uh, in, according to Popper, you should reject the theory. But Duane said, well, wait a minute, slow down. Um, because it could be that instead of the theory itself being wrong, maybe there was something that didn't work right with the experiment. Maybe there was something not, not right with the data analysis. Maybe there was something not right in one of the ancillary hypotheses. So you, science, in fact, if you look at the history of science, again, which is crucial uh, to understand these matters, uh, you know, scientists very rarely reject a theory the first time that it's falsified. What they do is they keep poking around. They, they keep, you know, changing the conditions of the experiment or the observations. They keep repeating stuff. They keep modifying slightly things. And then 
only if after a significant amount of time the thing really doesn't work and it keeps not working, uh, then they definitely reject it. Uh, let me give you the, the, the obvious example was the Copernican theory, which I mentioned earlier. So Copernicus had this brilliant idea that, hey, maybe it's not the, sun, the, 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 the earth that is at the center of the universe, it's the sun that is the center and, and you know, the planets go around. Let's see what happens if we redo the calculations that way. Well, it turns out that the calculations that Copernicus uh, came up with and, and later on Galileo were really not that much better than the ones that you can come up with uh, using the Ptolemaic system. In other words, using co- standard Copernican astronomy, uh, you do not get good predictions of the positions of the planets, which means that technically Copernican astronomy should have been falsified and therefore rejected as soon as it was proposed. And yet scientists beginning with Galileo and then eventually with Kepler, kept it around literally for decades until they figured out what the hell was wrong. Um, Kepler was the one that had the the, the crucial intuition. He said, wait a minute, we've been assuming here uh, for a long time that the orbits of the planets are circular. But the orbits of the planets don't have to be circular. There could be something else. For instance, they could be elliptical. And, of course, ellipses are sort of imperfect circles, so to speak, right? Um, Well, Turns out he was right. Uh, once you switch from, uh, from, from the assumption of circular orbits to the assumption of elliptical orbits, you, which you can calculate to a very high degree of, of accuracy, then all of a sudden everything falls into place and the Copernican theory, which really should be called the Copernican Keplerian theory, uh, holds very well. It, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, attempts at falsifying it and actually, uh, uh, don't, you know, they, they fail. So that is a very good example of Scientists not throwing out uh, the theory, even though it was, technically speaking, falsified. Now, why did they do that? Because that's an interesting question. You know, wh- why keep around the theory that doesn't seem to be doing much better than its rival? Why, why, why do that? Especially a theory in that, in, in that time and place that can get you into jail or, or burn at the stakes uh, for espousing it, right? Um, well, the answer probably is that people like Copernicus, Galileo, uh, Kepler, and a bunch of others – had this strong intuition that this this was the right way to go. This was a, a good path. Things were making more sense. There were a bunch of observations that were making more sense, even though there were still a lot of problems with theory. And so it was worth hanging around for a while to try to figure out how to solve the problems. This is exactly the situation that string theory finds itself now. String theory has been around since the 1980s. And it has not been... Not only it hasn't been falsified, but it hasn't even been tested, really, because there's no way at the moment to empirically test it. So in, in some sense, it's even worse than the Copernican theory. Uh, the, the, they haven't even gotten to the point of doing the test, right? But a lot of physicists um, have felt strongly enough about the theory because of its promises, because of its mathematical complexity, because of its, its properties uh, as, as a scientific theory, that, you know, maybe there is something there. That, in fact, very likely there is something there, so we should keep it around. Now, at some point, however, if the data really don't start coming in, if the theory doesn't actually face up to, to you know, the empirical world, then it will be abandoned. And in fact, over the last, just even in the last two or three years, there have been increasing noises by a number of prominent physicists, Lee Smalling, Peter Voigt, uh, uh, among others, uh, who are saying, you know, enough is enough. We've been keeping and playing around with this thing for decades. We, we wasted an entire generation of theoretical physicists uh, it doesn't seem to go anywhere, so it's time to sort of uh, change registry and, and, and do something else. Even Brian Green, one of the most vehement pro- proponents of the theory, just published an article uh, a few weeks ago where he started, sort of began to admit that the theory has not delivered. He still thinks that it's worth pursuing, but he finally is he, beginning to turn around and say, well, you know, I must admit there's, there's just nothing there to show um, in terms of uh, fundamental physics. So this is the standard way in which science works, which is why uh, falsificationism is, is a little too simple a tool. But as I said, ironically, it actually works better with pseudoscience than with science. So um, it sounds like maybe some of what you're saying is that some of these family resemblances are things like how many facts are explained by a theory or how well they're explained. Is that the kind of things that you're getting at for... Yeah. For that view. Um, yes. I, in fact, I proposed in uh, in uh, in the essay that I published for uh, in, in the collection with Martin, Philosophy of Pseudoscience. I proposed a number of criteria, uh, 
uh, in in um, in the same vein as Wittgenstein's family resemblance uh, concepts. And these criteria certainly have to do with uh, uh, empirical adequacy, right? And you, know, you want a theory to actually explain uh, and uh, the data and predict new data, so uh, predictive, mm-hmm. predictive ability. Um, the sophistication and structure of the theory itself, uh, you know, how well the theory actually uh, works with other scientific theories. I mean, uh, too often uh, creationists, for instance, in particular, but pseudoscientists in general, uh, well, there's, nobody really labels himself as pseudoscientist. Uh, uh, prefer as a pseudoscience in general. Um, so they have these, these very fragmented view of science. They think that they can show, for instance, that, I don't know, the Earth is uh, 12,000 12, years old and thereby disprove evolutionary theory without realizing that if that were the case, they would have also disproved all of chemistry, all of geology, and all of physics. Right? So the, the thing is, science... Because it is a cumulative enterprise, because it, it, it does build over time, um, you know, knowledge of, of the world, uh, if, you, if you take one of these basic building blocks out, the entire thing is going to fall down. Um, now, fine, if that has to be the case, okay. Uh, but you have to, be, to have very, very, very good reasons to demolish the whole thing, and you have to be able to replace it with something that is at least as solid as the stuff that you've destroyed. So... Uh, one of the characteristics of a good science, scientific theory is how it fits with other already well-established scientific theories. Um, I remember when I, when I was um, an undergraduate student at the University of Rome, I took a, a very interesting uh, uh, course in, in biophysics with Professor Mario Argeno, who was at the, at the time one of the leading physicists in, in, in Italy. And uh, he told us uh, several things about you know, the nature of scientific theory. One of the things that he kept repeating was, Take, for instance, the second principle of thermodynamics, uh, the one that says that entropy always go, uh, statistically always increases in the, uh, over time, so that, that, that uh, systems, be, physical systems become more and more disorderly over time. Um, he says, you know, if, if any new theory or notion is in contradiction with the second principle of thermodynamics, bet against that theory of notion, because the second principle is so well established it is one of the fundamental building blocks of modern physics. That for somebody to say, my theory is right and the second principle is wrong, that's very likely not going to happen. It's not impossible. It's nothing, you know, it's not, it's not absolutely out of the question. But if you have to bet your money, you definitely want to not, you don't want to bet it against the second principle. So that is the kind of thing that I think makes for uh, the, 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 the threads uh, that identify uh, a good science, and by and conversely, if they're missing, they identify a typical pseudoscience. Okay. Well, we've also been talking about creationists a lot, so yeah. <laughs> sometimes atheists are accused. I'm sure you've probably experienced this yourself. We're accused of assuming that science has all the answers. Yeah. And recently there was this well-known article published in the Wall Street Journal that's been making the rounds on Facebook and everywhere else about how science actually supports God. How would you say you see the relationship between science and religion, and does one have to place their so-called faith in science to be an atheist? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So th- th- there are several levels at which you can address that question. Um, at a very simple level, which is where most of these discussions, frankly, uh, occur, uh, the answer is no, of course not. You, th- th- science does not support uh, any notion of, of God, certainly any particular notion of God. I mean, not, science is not incompatible with the idea of a creator of the universe that then sort of basically retired and, and did nothing else. You know, that, that's basically the deist position, which has been popular ever since Voltaire. Uh, you know, most atheists seem to think, for instance, that Voltaire, the uh, French Enlightenment thinker, uh, was an atheist. He was not. He was, he was a deist. Most Enlightenment thinkers actually were deists, not, not atheists. Um, now, yes, science is compatible with that sort of God, and the reason for that is because that sort of God is rather amorphous. I mean, there's no structure there. There's nothing to say. You know, you, you can say, you yeah, know, well, something intelligent created the whole thing and then nothing else. You know, everything else then, then unfolded according to the natural, natural laws. Okay, well, I certainly cannot dispute that notion. I cannot, I cannot uh, deny it. it. It's not in contradiction with anything that I know from science. I also don't see any particular reason to believe it, however, because that the, the other side of that coin is not just uh, 
oh, science cannot explain everything. Of course science cannot explain everything. I, I completely agree. Uh, there is plenty of things that science cannot currently explain, and then very likely I'm going to bet there are going to be things that science will never be able to explain, simply because, let's not forget it, Science is a human epistemic activity. It is a way for human beings to understand the world. Human beings are finite. We have limited computational and thinking resources in our brains. We're expanding those resources by using computers, but even that is limited. So there's no guarantee whatsoever that the human brain, by using science or anything else, uh, will ever be able to understand everything. I don't, I'm not that naive and that optimistic about things. But the fact is, once you admit that, the other side does not get to say, aha, therefore, my particular version of, you know, mysticism, uh, is correct, because it just, it simply does not follow. I mean, the only thing that follows from the fact that science will forever be incomplete is that we will forever be partly ignorant about what's going on in the world. That's it. Um, it doesn't follow that any particular alternative notion is actually true. I, mean, I always go back to one of my favorite philosophers, David Hume. Uh, David Hume, uh, in the um, uh, inquiry into, into um, natu- uh, human understanding, talked a lot about how we understand things, how we, uh, we theorize about things. And essentially, he suggested that, and this is a direct quote, a wise man proportions his, his beliefs to the evidence. This is the same idea that Carl Sagan famously later on uh, popularized into the phrase, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? Um, and in fact, it was David Hume who wrote an essay on miracles, uh, where he made that argument to begin with. So the basic idea is, it is the sensible thing to do, is to believe in things in proportion to the evidence. If there is no evidence at all, then you should not believe. Um, and in fact, if there is good reasons to believe otherwise, of course, you should be, therefore, obviously skeptical. But, uh, you know, uh, when people ask me, you know, why are you an atheist? Um, I say, well, what I mean by that term is uh, the etymological uh, root of the word. Atheist means without a positive belief in God. It doesn't mean that I know that there is no God. It doesn't mean that I know that there is no version of the supernatural. It just means that I do not have any belief in that. And the reason I don't have any belief in that is because I don't see any evidence. Uh, should the evidence come come by, uh, then I'll, I'll hopefully I will be honest enough to you know change my mind or at least reconsider uh, the option. I just don't see the evidence. I mean, any any rational understanding of not only science, but even philosophy and, and any general way of understanding the world simply does not point toward the existence of the supernatural. Now, you mentioned that specific article and, you know, how science is uh, pointing toward the existence of a God. I don't know how people come up with these kind of things. Typically, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really annoying because it's, it's usually the result of a very superficial reading of certain scientific controversies. So typically these days, the, the main argument uh, whenever somebody says, you know, science supports the existence of, of God, it's got something to do with the fine-tuning of the universe, or I should say alleged fine-tuning of the universe. Yeah, actually in that article, one of the things that really stood out to me, and I know that uh, the Skeptics Guide podcast mentioned this too, this this author listed over two, he said there's over 200 parameters of the universe that had to be finely tuned in just the right way. And I'm thinking, where did he pull that number from? (laughs) Because there's no sourcing, of course. And even that, it seems like fine-tuning arguments often ignore the fact that they're usually isolating one parameter at a time and not really... I mean, I don't see how they have a way of even assessing how different things could be if all of these different parameters were actually changed at the same time. Right. So so part of the problem is, first of all, yes, you're right. It's not 200 parameters. I think the best estimate by the Astronomy Royal in, in, in England, who, who, by the way, in the UK, who, by the way, is in fact a, um, uh, a theist, um, uh, the, the best estimate of the parameters, I think, is something along the, along the lines of a dozen or so. Um, so these are the independent parameters, parameters that cannot be, at the moment of, at this particular stage in, in, in physical theory, they cannot be reduced any further. They cannot be, uh, be derived from other 
quantities. They are, they are what they call brute facts. They're, you know, this is just the way it is. Like, for instance, uh, the charge of the electron or, or the, the mass of the proton uh, or the gravitational constants. You know, if you ask me why is the mass of the proton the way it is or why is the gravitational constant the way it is, I say I have no idea. It's just the way it is, period. Um, it's, it's a brute fact. Now, um, is it true that science does not have an explanation for those parameters? Yes, it is. Uh, any, anybody who tells you otherwise is just, you know, making up stuff or going very speculative, um, because there are some speculative ideas about where these parameters come from. One of these speculative ideas, by the way, is string theory. String theory is supposed to give you a way to uh, bring down those parameters to ideally, potentially one, okay, one number. Um, but it hasn't, as we said before, it hasn't succeeded, at least not yet. So you can't say, oh, string theory explains. String theory doesn't explain it. String theory has the potential to explain fine-tuning, but it doesn't at the moment. There are other ways. You know, there's the, the idea of the multiverse. If, if, um, if it is true that our universe is just one of many universes, and each universe is basically created at random with a random set of parameters, then there is an infinite number of, of these universes. It, it, it then becomes absolutely not surprising that one of those, or even more than one, is compatible with the origin of life uh, and even sentient life. Fine. Uh, but do we know that there is such a thing as the multiverse? No. We, we don't have empirical evidence of the multiverse, so that too, that too is a speculation. So if, you, if one wants to make the point that science has some potential venues for answering the fine-tuning question, right? One of them is the multiverse, another one is string theory, and there are, there are a couple of others in, in play at the moment. Uh, yes, sure. But that does not mean that science has... An answer. At the moment, there is no answer. That is, in fact, an open question. Now, that's it. So what? Um, nothing follows from the fact that we don't know something. Um, you know, we used not to know how on Earth the, the planets of the solar system went around, go around the sun without falling in. Uh, Newton explicitly said that they do it because God wants it that way. Okay? Newton's answer to that question at the time was God. God did it. That's it. I don't have any 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 explanation scientifically, so God must have been doing it. Obviously, today, that makes us laugh, right? Because we have perfectly good explanation for why the planets don't fall uh, into the sun. So, to say that, oh, because science doesn't explain something now, uh, therefore, we, we're forced to conclude that there is an intelligent design, that's simply a illogical way of looking at things. At the same time, however, it's also disingenuous, and I, and I chastise some of my atheist friends on this, it's also disingenuous to just trot out things like string theory and, mul and multiverse as answers because they're not. We, we don't know if either one of those is true, and therefore they cannot be answers. I go back to my comment, the, the comment that I made a few minutes ago, which is, on the one end, this could be a situation similar to the one that Newton uh, faced. It could be that tomorrow, in the next 30 years or in the next 100 years, some brilliant guy or woman is going to come up and say, hey, you know that fine-tuning thing? Here's where it comes from. And now we got the answer and we're, we're done. Good. Or it may very well be that this is one of those questions to which we will never have an answer. We're just not smart enough or we just don't have enough information. I mean, one of the possibilities, for instance, with string theory is that string theory may be right, but we're simply never going to be able to build a particle accelerator that reaches... Um, uh, the level of energy that is necessary to do the proper experiments, just because that level of energy is literally at a cosmic scale. You know, we can't build as accelerators that, that funnel the energy of a galaxy or, or, or of a, a cluster of stars or things like that. We just can't do it. And very likely, we will never be able to do it. If that's the case, that could be a, a ironic situation where our brains were smart enough to think out the theory but our material circumstances are such that we cannot actually build the, the, the instruments to do the experiments. Well, my friend, join the club. Uh, you know, this is just the human condition. Sometimes we just have to say, I don't know. And I, I, I think that's something that both atheists and theists really need to wrap their minds around. Sometimes the best answer we have is, I have no clue.
Yeah, it seems like a lot of of what we've been talking about is kind of just this is this is the best we can do. This is provisional thinking right now, and there's yeah. there's not really any answers that are kind of going to come down from on high or anything like that. Yeah. And I mean, you hear people talk all the time about science presupposes uniformity, science is always changing, and all these sorts of things. But at at the end of the day, I just keep having to be forced to say, well, what do you want? What do you expect? I mean, exactly. as- aside from wanting absolute certainty, you're still going to have to deal with problems like, you know, your individual perception and how you get from that to all these objectivist claims about, you know, gods and divinely inspired texts and right. all this other stuff. Yeah, and, and look, one way to think about uh, the different claims and the different, different ways of approaching things is is using a Bayesian perspective. So, you know, Bayes' theory basically is the theory is a fundamental theory in probability theory, which essentially is a mathematical um, sort of uh, restatement, formal restatement of Hume's dictum of the 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 the, the phrase, the advice that Hume uh, gave us that I mentioned a few minutes ago that that you should proportion your belief to the evidence. A, a good Bayesian operator, a good Bayesian thinker. Uh, Keeps updating uh, uh, his, his estimate of the probability of something being true, uh, according with whatever else you knew before, and with the new evidence that comes in. So the idea is that you start with a certain number of hypotheses about something or some number, number of notions, and then you look at the empirical data coming in, and you update uh, what what uh, Bayesians call your priors, in other words, your your belief. Uh, in one hypothesis over the other, and you see over time that some hypotheses become much, much, you know, higher in, in terms of priors. They become more and more probable, and others become lower and lower. So it's always a question of, uh, if you want to put it in lay terms, is what's your alternative? So you are claiming that all of science, fundamental physics, biology, geology, chemistry, they're all wrong. Fine. Now, on our side, we have centuries of highly successful empirical evidence and theorizing, which has brought to us not just the idea of, a, of the Big Bang and evolution, but also ways to cure diseases, you know, uh, the, the damn computer on which you post stuff on Facebook, and so on and so forth. Those things have worked. Now, what do you got on the other side? If you say that creation science is a science, what sort of novel machinery, what sort of novel uh, insights and discoveries into the universe have you come up with? And the answer, of course, is nothing. And if that's the case, then I think you should just shut up. Or at least be a little more humble. Well, to wrap things up then, what do you have coming up on the horizon? Are there any new books or exciting new interviews or fields of interest you'd like to tell us about? Sure. Um, very briefly, I have two books that are coming out, uh, um, the, hopefully one by the end, by the end of this year and then the other one, uh, sometime early next year. Uh, they're both by the University of Chicago Press, which is my, it's become recently my, my publisher uh, preference. Uh, one book is a single author book. It's, it's, it's my, it's, I wrote it basically. Um, and it is about whether and how philosophy makes progress. Uh, so one, one of the questions that often come up in these kinds of discussions is, oh, science has made all these progress. Philosophy is always talking about the same stuff. I don't think that that's the case. And so in the book, I explore the nature of philosophy, the nature of science, and also by, by comparison, the nature of mathematics and logic. And uh, I come up with a uh, theory of how philosophy makes progress, and then that sort of um, present a number of examples of how that works, and argue that it works in a in a way that is different from the notion of progress in in science, and is actually much closer to the notion of progress in other disciplines such as mathematics and logic. So that's one thing that's coming out. Um, and uh, the second one is a colla- is, a, is a second collection with Martin Baudry, uh, my my co-editor for the Philosophy of Pseudoscience uh, book. Uh, we're putting together a new collection on scientism, on this idea that uh, sometimes uh, people, either scientists or other people, make claims on behalf of science that actually go beyond the pale, that go beyond what science actually warrants. And what we did was we put together a, uh, we organized a, a workshop on, on the uh, issue of scientism uh, here at City University of New York. Uh, we invited a number of philosophers and scientists to uh, present papers, and then we collected a, a number of these and a few others. Uh, and there will be a range of uh, sort of notions, a range of, of opinions. There would be some people who've 
who simply don't think that scientism is an actual problem, uh, to people that think that scientism is a really serious problem, to people like me who are somewhere in between and think that scientism actually does exist. There are, there are examples of it, uh, but it's not, a, it's, not, it's not a catastrophe. So that one also should be coming out, but that one is, is still being put together. Um, so it, it will probably come out in 2016. Well, those definitely sound worth reading. Uh, do you, if anybody wants to find out more about you or your work, where's a website they can get um, your info? My, from? my website is uh, platofootnote.org, um, <laughs> and that comes from a, a famous uh, uh, quote by uh, Whitehead, I, I believe it was, um, who said that all philosophy is but a footnote to Plato. It's a slight exaggeration, um, but I thought that the name was cute, so it's Plato Footnote, one word, uh, dot org. Uh, but also, if you don't mind, would like uh, your listeners to go, uh, if they're interested, uh, to my uh, new online magazine. Uh, it's called Scientia Salon. Uh, it's found at scientiasalon.org. Scientia is spelled S-C-E. Uh, um, <laughs> let me get it right. It's uh, S-C-I-E-N-T-I-A. Uh, it's similar to science. It's the, it's the Latin word for knowledge. And uh, Scientia Salon is um, a magazine where uh, academics, mostly scientists and philosophers, uh, write about their own research and their own field for a general audience and where the, the readers are, engage, are in, uh, um, encouraged to engage at length with you know, high-quality, uh, long discussions, in-depth discussions uh, about whatever gets published. So the, the current uh, um, article, for instance, uh, that it's just just came out um, yesterday, as it turns out, is on the idea of reductionism and uh, and emergence, and is written by a physicist, um, and uh, it's it's generated uh, the, this, the physicist in question is uh, Marko Bojinovic, and um, he's generated a lot of interesting discussion. It's it's one of those. Uh, it's becoming a, a fairly high quality place for. You know, no trolling, lots of interesting discussions where people get to interact directly with professionals uh, about the development of, the, of ideas in their own field. Yeah, that sounds like if anybody's interested in the stuff we've been talking about here, that would be a great resource. And I'd also strongly recommend your Rationally Speaking podcast, as I've listened to that for a while and become a huge fan of it. So, Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, Massimo. This was a pleasure. Thanks. I'd like to thank Dr. Piliucci for coming on the show. If you'd like to find out more about him or purchase any of his books, links are available in the description for this episode at godlesshaven.com. At godlesshaven.com, you can also find out more about the show, more about myself, and plenty of additional content. Music in the show is my own work. Thank you for listening, and please join me again in the not-too-distant future for another episode of Armchair Atheism. 